All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am Mark Joseph. I'm a professor here at the Mandel School and uh, director of the National Initiative on Mixed Income Communities. And it's our pleasure to welcome so many of you all out this afternoon. I see folks from the school. We got students, faculty, staff. We got a bunch of folks from the community, uh, which we really appreciate. I see Michael Cosgrove from the city here. I mean, we got really a lot of folks out. So thank you for coming out. Imagine, if you will, the same number of people who are in this room online right now watching. So we have twice the number uh, online as well. So that is fantastic. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, I want to say some quick thank yous before I get to introducing our guest who has brought you all out. And first and foremost, I want to thank our team at the National Initiative on Mixed Income Communities that have worked very, very hard to pull this together. So I don't know if Don Ellis, is back there working away. Taryn Gress, is she out there? Emily Miller, maybe out there as well. Can we give them a hand for their work? Thank you all very, very much for pulling this together. Uh, there's Taryn. Thanks, Taryn. I also want to thank Dr. Jerry Mahoney who is now our Associate Dean for Research, has stepped in for that at the Mandel School, and he has graciously agreed to co-sponsor this colloquium. So can we thank Jerry for that? And then also we've had our IT team, our communications team, we've had work on flyers, getting the word out, Media Vision is here, allowing us to live stream this, so thank you very much to that team as well. All right, to what you all came for, it is a deep pleasure to introduce uh, someone who has been a friend and colleague, I think we're going on 13, 14 years at this point, uh, Dr. Amy Carre, who as you have read, uh, has her BSW and MSW from the University of Kansas and her PhD from the University of Chicago. Uh, Amy has been studying mixed income communities, mixed income development for as long as I have. Uh, so literally, when I got into the field, uh, Amy actually started out as a research subject of mine. Uh, we were at the university, and Amy was at one of the developers at Jazz on the Boulevard. And so she was figuring out development and asset management and property management, so she was on the practice side. And then she saw that the really cool work was on the research side. And so we literally had a lunch meeting where she said, these questions you've been asking, I think I'd interviewed her a couple times at that point, really have sparked my interest in learning more about this field, what would be a pathway? I mean, it's kind of cool to think about now. This is back in 2003, 2004. What would be a pathway uh, to be able to do what you do? And it was a kind of cool moment to have someone who was on that practice side, really intrigued by the research side, and we kind of mapped out. And now we have to have a research director position available at the time, and I said, the first thing you should do is come work with us as the research director, and she joined our mixed income study. And so for the next seven years, uh, she was our project director and then a doctoral student when she joined uh, the University of Chicago. So since that time, we've been working together. Most recently, uh, Amy joined our initiative here at Case as a research affiliate. And so really, maybe coming on two years now, she's been a research affiliate with our team on several of our projects, mentoring staff, counseling me, uh, moving the work forward, and I think the future is bright for even deeper engagement with the center. So very, very excited about all that. Um, with that, I'm going to hand over to Amy because I know she's going to tell you more about herself. So if you could join me in welcoming Dr. Kare. Okay, thank you so much, Mark, for the introduction. It's such a pleasure to be in Cleveland, Cleveland, Ohio. It is my former home. It's so wonderful to see my old supervisor from Slavic Village Development, Bobby Richtel, and many of you uh, familiar faces. It's um, happy, happy to have um, time with you today. And all of you that are watching online, we've got people from a small town in Ch um, North Carolina all the way to um, very close to Silicon Valley in, um, in California. So across the nation, people are tuning in and tuning in to this conversation about racial and economic justice and how we might, as whole cities and regions, have a new set of policies to address 
what has been a long-standing challenge for our, our nation. So I'm excited to be here today. Um, just to kind of give you an overview, I'm going to talk fairly quickly, about 25 minutes. Um, I'm, my goal is to give you a taster, really, of different studies um, and findings from those studies of work that I've done over the last um, 10 years. And then from that, draw your attention to three major takeaways that I want you to leave with. And then I'm going to end the presentation with an invitation, an invitation to you that I'll start with and then we'll, we'll, we'll revisit. And after that, we'll turn to a set of questions and answers and discussion that really allows us to engage um, as, um, as participants in the room, OK? So that's for today. Um, so setting the context, um, I, again, we are facing a moment in our nation's history like none before. We're seeing levels of radical organizing um, among diverse groups of people, people across racial identities, people across age groups who are um, really calling attention to the injustice that has been a part, um, long time part of our history, but also is contemporary and in its reality that um, there's inequitable outcomes from our nation's um, government policies. There's inequitable outcomes in education, in health, and in the criminal justice system. All of this together is forcing us into a new conversation. And the conversation we need to be having is how to move from a culture of segregation and exclusion and inequity to a culture that embraces differences and embraces inclusion and equity. And that is a radical change that we have to go through. It's not one that's easy to do. It's one that's going to make most of us uncomfortable. And it's that discomfort that we have to work through individually, interpersonally, um, as um, communities. Um, it's that discomfort that will lead to, hopefully, a level of healing um, that can allow us to transcend difference. Um, so the three major takeaways for today's talk, I'm going to preview them now, and we'll revisit each of them through the presentation. So the first um, is some sad news. And, and that sad reality is that our current policies to address segregation and poverty may not result in positive benefits for the communities in which they're intended to benefit. So we know this from a set of research that I'll be sharing with you. Um, there's good news at the end of that um, statement, and I'm going to share that as well. The second major takeaway is that policies to address segregation must focus on four different kinds of efforts. So not only integration or desegregation in residential settings or in school settings, but also we need to be having more policies that focus on equity and justice, regardless of where people live and where they go to school. Um, we also need to be having a conversation about how democratic participation, voice, and power um, can shift um, the opportunities for people to participate and, and, vo and actually make a difference in our government systems. Um, so that we don't reinforce policies of, of exclusion. And finally, we need to have dialogues across and within groups of differences. Um, the third takeaway for today is that inclusion and equity are not only concepts to be understood in research or in community practice, but they are fundamental to who we are as human beings. And that's that message that I want you to leave with in terms of your individual role and responsibility to be an active participant in shaping the future of, of working across differences. So looking beyond, um, looking within and looking beyond. I'm going to start with myself, because I'm asking you to go and start with um, a conversation with yourself. So um, I'm going to do that for, for you to kind of get a sense of who am I and why, as a white woman who has a PhD and who has worked in pretty um, low-income communities of color my whole life, but who came from a place of privilege and power because of my economic status, 
um, why do I care about this issue? What, what, what brings me to kind of give um, two cents about segregation? This is my family history. You'll see my brother and um, Jay Turnbull um, is a, a man with a disability. Um, he was born with significant disabilities. And so I grew up in a culture of disability where segregation was really part of my life because of his life. He was on a segregated bus. He was living in a segregated um, systems of housing. Um, and it was that level of segregation that I witnessed and experienced as a family member that called me to have some cluing in to what exclusion looks like and feels like. And so that led me then to a kind of a new kind of relationship that I formed with both my husband, Rahul Kare, his parents who are immigrants from India, and our full-time childcare provider who is also an immigrant, Adriana, who is here and who um, has taught me a lot about what it means to live across um, national boundaries and cultural boundaries. So that's um, part of who I am as a white person. Um, this is the stories behind my whiteness, is that there's a part of me, like you, that can look beyond your own racial identity that you were born with. Um, so. As Mark said, I've got a foundation in community practice. I'm a social work lifer. Um, I have been working in communities for most of my career, um, but more recently have turned to um, research and really asking some broader questions about how research can impact the um, communities um, of color. And also, more recently, affluent communities. What is the role of affluence within this conversation? Um, so that's my experience. Um, I, I come to kind of three major lines of work that, that we'll, we'll talk about today. One is a focus on inclusion and equity through the cost of segregation um, study and the grand um, challenges for social work paper that I'll present. Um, another focus that's been on anti-poverty um, place-based initiatives, um, work with the Urban Institute out of Washington, D.C. for many years. Um, and then more recently, um, working with the National Initiative on Mixed Income Communities, um, I've been able to take the longtime research I've been doing and putting it in the field of practice. Um, so in terms of my approaches, I'm mixed methods. You know, if, if you have more questions about kind of research later, we can entertain some of those. But the main point here is that I'm committed to doing actionable research so that it's not just um, the knowledge for knowledge sake, but the knowledge for a so what does this mean for the, the residents of, of Slavic Village um, or um, the communities in Chicago that, uh, that I've worked with. So the first study, first study, remember the key takeaway from this study, um, this set of studies, is that the policies that are intended to benefit low-income communities of color do not always lead to those benefits, those social benefits. Um, so we know from the line of re research that Mark Joseph and Rob Chaskin have um, created um, th through the Mixed Income Community Study um, that was based at the University of Chicago. We know from their study, as, as well as my recent study, which is my dissertation, um, it's called Privatizing Chicago, and it's a um, ethnography that looks at the political and economic um, decisions made by um, a large range of, of people, including including people in positions of power and resource, like investors and developers, the, how the decisions they make and the policies that they um, are constrained by actually matter for um, what was created in terms of Chicago's um, public housing redevelopment policies. So what did we learn from these? We learned from these, um, these two major bodies of work um, that incorporated exclusion is part of the experience for residents who are living in mixed income communities. That's a term that was coined by um, Mark Joseph and Rob Chaskin. What it means is that people may live physically in a building or on a block that um, is in an integrated space where they might be interacting with people across economic and racial differences, but um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're actually included um, in a meaningful way in terms of participating within those communities. And in fact, they are, um, um, they, we have found that they've been excluded in many ways because of their race and their class. Um, Secondly, we've learned that the privatization of public goods and services, such as the privatization of public housing, when we move to a, a market-driven model, 
where there is a profit um, that uh, can be made from, in this case, public housing, um, that, that it leads to more complicated circumstances in terms of what are driving the interests um, and what may be the possibilities for both economic and social benefits for residents in particular because the political and economic realities in which these policies are being implemented um, may tip towards a more market-driven approach versus uh, the social benefit approach. Um, and finally, we know that the power of political leaders, um, such as some of you put it, um, on, online or um, in the room, we know that you, the leaders and the investors and the developers behind um, the policy implementation process um, have a lot of ability to also shape. So that agency that they have um, can actually help shape more positive social benefits. So with all the negative of kind of like, oh, man, we put all this money and all these years into trying to create mixed income communities, and what, they're not really helping the people that they were um, intended to benefit? Well, the good news is, is that there's still room for change within the policy structure and framework. We don't necessarily have to accept um, that those social benefits are not yet, um, that they can't be actualized. We believe at the National Initiative on Mixed Income Communities that there is an operating culture shift that can and should happen um, in the development community and among others um, who are part of the implementation process, property managers, resident services um, teams, and leaders themselves, community um, residents themselves, that shift in the way that they function may actually amount to more positive benefits. So this gives you a sense of kind of some pictures um, of the work that we've been doing across the nation to, um, to provide services and con uh, consulting services as well as capacity building to help those communities do just that. So we've been working in Austin, Texas, and San Francisco, and Washington, DC, and other places um, with our partners, uh, trusted, space part, um, trusted Space Partners. OK, so next, um, again, the, or sorry, the last key takeaway here is that um, the policies that are intended to benefit don't always do so. So again, stick with that. Um, the hope, again, is that we can actually get to some um, reality checking about what's really happening and what does our data show in terms of displacement, in terms of um, people's income and um, job situations changing, in terms of children who are growing up in these communities actually getting into schools um, that are going to lead them down an opportunity path. Um, there is options, and so if we're if we're faced with reality and we're open with what's really happening, um, then it can lead to some necessary understanding that hopefully can promote change. So the next study that, that I want to present is a study that is um, led by the Metropolitan Planning Council in Chicago, as well as Urban Institute in Washington, DC. And our funders are the MacArthur Foundation and the Chicago Community Trust. You'll see the two reports here. There's one report that was published by um, Urban Institute that's available on their website. And the other report that was published by Metropolitan Planning Council, it's a more local um, Chicago-based um, data and really intended to shift the narrative around segregation and inequality within Chicago, um, as well as to pr provide um, some meaningful data that can drive uh, political decision making. So what are the driving research questions that we ask? We ask, what does it cost all of us to live so separately from each other by race and income? And given its negative impact on issues of equity, what can we do to change patterns of segregation? Um, I want to take a moment just to problematize the, the idea of segregation. Um, again, I started with this idea of do we really want to have um, a focus on integration or can and should we have a broader focus? And it's really essential, I think, for all of us to kind of um, not assume that segregation and its problems should lead to solutions that are only focused on integration, um, but rather that we need to have a broader frame, and that frame being one that's about inclusion and equity. This slide gives you an idea of also the difference between equity and equality. 
And so um, my, my hope is that we could engage in some conversations even today about what is that difference? What does that mean? And for me, it really is um, this visual helps to describe what um, is necessary when it comes to equity. And that is that we don't all start on the same, um, we don't start from the same beginning. Um, as a, a white woman and as um, a woman who um, was born into a level of economic privilege, I definitely um, had a, a leap out the door. And I think those of us who are honest with our own histories um, can should be able to wrestle with the fact that we may need to give up something in order for others to have um, an equal playing ground. Um, but that is what equity um, has meant to me in my life, is really looking for opportunities for that. In terms of our national findings, you can see Cleveland is on the map as one of the 10 most um, economically and racially segregated regions within the nation. This probably isn't surprising for um, most of you in the room. Um, but if you look at those other cities, you can also kind of see what are some similarities between them. Um, we do know, um, based on our um, analysis, that there was an economic cost. And I'm going to show you a little bit about what that economic cost is. We looked at these different variables um, when we were trying to measure the economic cost. And there's three major findings from this study um, that relate to cost. Before going there, though, the national findings are really that um, African American and white um, segregation is dropping. Um, and that is a positive, but we're seeing an increase in Latino and white segregation. Um, in general, though, blacks and whites still seem to be more segregated from one another than Latinos and whites. And those of you that are working in community development probably have some theories as to why that might be the case, why African American neighborhoods, black neighborhoods may be the hardest to actually create integration within or around. Um, and also, we know that higher levels of black white segregation are um, associated with higher murder rates. So plate regions where there's higher segregation also are regions where there's higher murder rates. Um, and finally, we know that regions with higher levels of economic segregation also experience lower um, black incomes and, and bachelor's degree attainment. Um, and that regions with higher levels of black white segregation experience low Black, in, um, black incomes and BA attainment and lower white BA attainment, OK? So how does the um, Cleveland region compare? This gives you an, um, an idea of kind of Cleveland's level of segregation. You can see kind of the dots all grouping together in terms of African Americans, Latinos, and then whites spread out more across the region. Houston is actually at the national median of um, segregation right now. So they're in the, about the 50th. They rank 50th out of 100 metro areas as being more moderately racially segregated. And here, the dots um, are more spread out, especially the Latino population and even the African American population. So if you compare a region like Houston to Cleveland, this might be where you might want to go. You might want to be, as a region, um, a place where segregation, you, you set the goal of, we'd like to see our segregation drop within a t the next 10-year period, what would it take to get there? Um, that's the question that we are trying to answer in Chicago right now. Um, so what does segregation cost us in the Chicago metro area? We only did cost figures for Chicago. So I don't have any figures to, sh to share with you about, well, what does it cost the Cleveland region? If you're interested in that analysis and study, we can talk later about that and about the engagement um, of real data that could, could influence your policies. But for Chicago, we found that there was a $4.4 billion annual regional income loss. Um, primarily among African Americans, who would have earned more had Chicago been at the median level of, of segregation. Um, we know that um, there was a 30% more um, homicides, so lost lives. And we also know that there was, um, a, a, we would see an increase in the number of bachelor's degrees, again, if our region was at the national median. So I'm going to go, the, go through this pretty quickly. Um, again, can talk about it later. But just to kind of give you a sense of what does that mean? What does that translate? It translates to in lost income. It resulted in a um, $8 billion boost um, to the region's 
GDP if we were at the median. Again, if Chicago became at the median, we would see an, an $8 billion increase in um, the, the regional economy. That's a big number. That's a lot of taxpayer dollars, and that's a lot of consumer dollars that could be spent um, in and around the region. Um, we also know, again, around lost lives, that this translated actually to 229 lives that could have been prevented had Chicago been at the national median. Um, and if the, the homicide rate, again, had been reduced by 30% lower, what does that translate into cost? That translates into costs that went into the criminal justice system rather than prevention strategies like education and health and human services. So we know that there was a cost to the region's government system um, in terms of uh, $218 million a year in correction costs. And finally, we know that there was lost potential. Again, back to this idea of what would it mean if our region was better educated, we know that 83,000 more people in the whole region would have been able to um, obtain a BA degree, and that was um, both African Americans and um, other people. Um, we know then that um, we're seeing a loss in lifetime earnings across um, um, uh, across these individuals who essentially could have gotten an education, a college degree, and then would have been more um, contributing um, to the regional economy. So those are the major um, economic findings. Again, lost income, lost lives, and lost potential. Now, if that's not en enough to motivate policymakers to do something about segregation, then I'm not sure what is. This um, is pretty powerful data, I think, for, for us to think about, can we fix the challenges of segregation, in part because we would believe that the region um, of, of Cleveland and Cuyahoga County could um, be in a healthier economic um, environment if, if they were to address it. Um, it's a question, I think, for conversation and debate later today. So what policies can build a more inclusive and equitable um, metro region and neighborhood? We are currently in the phase of discovery right now. So I don't want to suggest that these are our final results. Rather, we are still trying to answer that second question, the, section, the question of given its negative impacts on, um, on inequity, what should we be doing about segregation? Right now, we're proposing um, policy changes in uh, several different areas. Um, but just to give you a sense of how we're discovering these policies, we're taking a scan of national practices and policies across the nation. We're looking um, to our local stakeholders and um, their um, ideas and opinions. Um, we've got interviews, focus groups, and a survey going on. And we are also doing um, spatial analysis where we're predicting the Chicago region in 2030. So we're not trying to plan for how do we address segregation with our current population, but rather we're thinking who is going to be the future um, residents who are going to be living in Chicago, and therefore how can we think about where best to, they could live and how best to create more options for equity for them. Um, quickly, um, this just gives you a sense of how we're thinking about it as well geographically. We have a typology here that we've um, imagined, and now we're doing some spatial analysis to really put the different neighborhood types within, um, gra within graphs. But we're kind of um, imagining the predominant race, the predominant income, and other kinds of dynamics that exist when, within these different communities. And you can see that we're interested just as much as in, um, in low income or very low income communities of concentrated poverty and of racial segregation among um, people of, um, of color as we are to addressing concentrated wealth um, among um, communities that are white and that have traditionally been part of the problem as to why exclusionary um, practices and discrimination continue to exist. Um, so those are our geographies. Again, um, these are kind of new emerging findings, not yet solid, but to give you an idea of where we think we might be landing is that in order to create more inclusive communities and 
whole cities for that matter, we think that there's four different policy approaches that are needed. One that focuses on um, desegregation and integration at the neighborhood level and regional scales, a, a focus on equity and justice within systems, a focus on democratic participation, voice, and power shifting, again, in a place like Chicago where machine politics are pretty, pretty strong, um, this becomes a pr an important um, dynamic to shifting conversations and shifting um, resource allocation. And then finally, um, a focus here on dialogue within and across groups. And that means, again, across groups of racial um, difference and across um, groups that could also be different in other way, um, ways economically, um, gender, um, age. Um, OK, so the next and final study I'll be presenting and the final um, uh, before you know, launching into a hopefully more interactive dialogue with you is a new paper that is also not yet published. Um, it is in its final version. It's a grand challenge for the field of social work. And in our grand challenge, um, my co-author, Molly Metzger, who's from the from Washington um, University, she and I are proposing that multiple strategies need to be um, part of the conversation, that rather than just solely focusing on the most marginalized or oppressed communities, that we need to be looking across different areas. So again, the focus here um, on what do you do about um, communities like um, Sugar and Falls or Solon or, or, or Westlake, um, communities where there may have traditionally been um, white um, exclusion taking place, is there levers of change around attitudes um, within um, the um, government systems, within the school systems, um, within um, the real estate industry? How can we think about how to um, create more inclusivity within these spaces? Um, so it's not just about the right to, um, the opportunity to move to a new place, which is kind of a mobility strategy we're pretty familiar with within the field. You get a housing voucher, you get to move to a, quote, high opportunity neighborhood. But rather, it's once you get there, how do you thrive? How do you, how do you help ensure that your children aren't um, excluded from um, this, within this, the after school programs at school, um, or that they're getting the most benefit from those high opportunity communities. So we're very interested in that question and inclusionary housing, some new work that um, I'm doing with Mark Joseph and others will allow us to be more strategic about thinking about that. Um, here in Cleveland, you are familiar with um, gentrification dynamics. Ohio City and other places have um, transformed in the last 15 to 20 years. And so are these spaces um, that are gentrifying, are they gentrifying in a way that allows people the right to stay and the right to stay in a way that they actually have some social connection with their new neighbors, with the newcomers that um, may be of higher income or of different racial um, groups. And here, there's a real importance to looking um, at all sorts of, um, of, of strategies that would allow people to have kind of more voice and participation across differences. Finally, what do we do about the um, systemic and enduring um, reality that segregation um, is not going away easily. It would take Chicago um, actually about 65 years. It wouldn't be until 20, um, 2070 um, for us as a region to get to the median um, level of segregation if there were no changes in current um, practices. So that's a long time to wait. That's whole generations of people who are going to be lost and still living in, um, in communities where the opportunities are not ripe um, for change. So what can we do um, to intervene here? There are a host of different strategies that we're pursuing at the National Ish Initiative on Mixed Income Communities to help support these communities. But we also value these communities. We don't want to disrupt them in a way that strips their identity, their culture, um, their, um, their ability to actually have their voice be a part of the process. So it's important to note that communities of color that are, um, you know, have been um, real assets as well and, and not, um, not view them solely through a, a deficit lens. 
Um, so the grand challenge that we're issuing in this paper is that we believe that inclusion and equity are concepts um, that can and should be understood within policy frameworks, but they also need to be understood in our own professional journey as social workers. How many of you in the room consider yourself a social worker? Okay, how many of you see this as part of your daily or weekly responsibility to create more economic and racial justice? <coughs> it's great, I love seeing that. Um, it is in, um, important that we look at our own identities in order to be able to face our realities and face um, the, the, have the courage really to do something about it. So the, the, t the key takeaways, I think since with the preview, you've got, got them. I think I'm not gonna go through this again, um, but what I am gonna do is now issue the invitation. And um, my friends, um, Bill Trainer and Frankie Blackburn, um, and Yardine, all of them at Trusted Space Partners have helped me think about this idea of what is the invitation that we want to issue. And for me, what is that invitation? Well, that invitation is for, for myself and for my colleagues um, to be in a place where we're, we're critiquing our own work and we're critiquing our own lives our own journeys, our own daily choices, our own um, choice of how we spend our money, where we spend our money, um, so that we're moving away from a culture um, uh, that we consistently participate in, um, which is a culture of exclusion and segregation, and instead we're inviting a new culture, an alternative reality that can allow us to actually envision what would it be like to be in a place of inclusion and equity. And so for me, the way I've been do doing this, just it's a very small way, but I've been capturing when I'm in places where I feel exclusion taking place, I take pictures and I document those pictures for myself and I share them. And I also do so when I'm in places where I feel a sense of inclusion and a brighter um, uh, future of, of kind of an aspirational future. So this just gives you some recent pictures. This was the U2 concert on the left side this past summer. This was a group of friends and I at Napa Valley um, in California. And then of course, um, on my trek um, on, the, on the water in Chicago, I get to see this lovely building. Um, but I think it's important to recognize I'm part of this. I'm part of a culture of exclusion and the way that I function. And I'm sharing that as someone who's struggling with that and, and asking to be in struggle with you um, as a white ally working in anti-racist work. Um, but I'm also in, in spaces of inclusion. And so this gives you some pictures. The place that I felt most um, included, um, a, a sense of inclusion, um, surprisingly, was at this water park in um, Wisconsin, um, and also at this Waffle House in North Carolina. This was my summer fun. And it was amazing that I, to be in a, especially a Waffle House in um, Southern, in the South, where there was more both, um, people working there, but the staff, but also people eating there were of a very diverse racial background. And that really made me um, happy to be in that opportunity, you know, that space. So again, the invitation is there for you um, to join me in this journey of self-reflection um, and professional reflection um, as we um, tackle what we know is our nation's greatest challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. So proud of you. I can't even say it. I'm just filled with pride in this moment because this has not been an easy journey to get to this moment. It's been a long journey. So to hear that so eloquently presented. All right, your turn. Q and A. Questions, comments from the audience. Jonathan, you have one? Or Maris has one? Go ahead, Maris. I, yeah, um, I was just wondering, you talked a lot about um, the loss of Could you actually introduce yourself? Oh, so sorry. Everyone knows Hi, everyone. I'm Maris. Um, I'm a first year MSAS student here at Case. And guess where our um, team ate last night? At Broco. Yeah. It wasn't working. I'll Maris be there tonight. Maris works at Broco. Um, <laughs> So um, I was just wondering, you talked a lot about the loss of lives and the loss of income, and I was wondering if you or your team have done research about like why. Like, mm -hmm. what are those underlying things that are causing the high, those higher you know, murder rates or that loss of income? So mm -hmm. what's behind the mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, 
this study was not designed to address um, or to ask the question, um, or what is the causes of segregation? Um, I think all of us have ideas of what the past segregation, you know, what, what caused it back in the formation of our nation in terms of the Native American population and, um, and, and Mexican American population, um, and certainly slavery. The, what is the long lasting relevance of slavery um, in terms of the benefits to white people and white communities? Um, but I think that in its current production, how we understand contemporary um, reasons for continued segregation, there are a lot of other theories that are out there as to why. Um, but it's not, it wasn't um, a question that we sought to ask. And it's actually proving a little challenging. Because if you don't ask what the causes are, it's hard then to make the link to, well, then what do you do about it? And so just to be frank, we're in a, a, you know, a conversation within Metropolitan Planning Council right now about um, how can we specify um, what, not what we think as the research and policy team, but what our community um, thinks. And so we've been doing interviews with people across different um, communities to really seek to answer that question. Uh, because not, it may not matter so much the research answer to that, um, but what may matter more is actually what the narrative is um, among people about what the causes are, because that may be what then forces political um, change, right? So I hope that was helpful. Good. Can you hold it for me? Introduction. Uh, my name is Jonathan, and I'm a dual degree law and social work student. I had the privilege of working with NIMC and Professor Rossman. Uh, this summer, I worked in Chicago at the Lawyers Committee for Better Housing, mm -hmm. and I uh, spent a lot of time in housing court. and. Uh, I guess something, you, earlier you mentioned should the focus be integration. And uh, mm -hmm. given the, you know, just the intentional efforts to segregate communities, mm -hmm. segregate schools, uh, I'm wondering, you know, should the, should the focus be more on making things a little bit more equal and, uh, and then sort of moving towards the, the integration part? It seems like at least, you know, my experience in the housing court this summer, especially in Chicago, is that uh, people were being evicted and sort of going back to the same situations mm -hmm. where the housing conditions were uh, horrific. And so, but most of the research now is all about integration. So how do you feel uh, sort of not losing the integration aspect, but really focusing on uh, equality within neighborhoods and, and school systems and mm -hmm. to that extent? Well, I think in order for us to get to more equitable outcomes, we have to first start with, um, like, being really um, transparent about um, the realities of uh, resource allocation. So we're not going to reach equitable outcomes if, our, um, if we still focus on equality in um, how um, resources are allocated. A great example of this is public schools. Public school formulas typically mean that most schools get about the same amount of money um, based on their population of students. And yet we know that students with special needs, students who are suffering from hunger and homelessness are traditionally located in more um, challenging neighborhoods. And so why are we not having conversations about how to reallocate school financing so that more resources go to those schools and last to the others. I think that's how we're going to reach um, uh, opportunities um, that become more equal. Now, those are really difficult conversations, right? Because we're talking about uh, potentially, um, and I think in Chicago, we're talking about um, some conversations that have to not just be about African American and Latino um, and white communities, but it's also about Latino and, and, and black communities and kind of the divide that um, does exist within Chicago of those um, populations and those neighborhoods in part because of um, a longstanding challenge around resource allocation. Um, but rather than seeing it as a, did the west side get what they needed and the south side get what they needed and the aldermen kind of fighting over little buckets of money, we need to have a broader conversation about how do we reallocate um, so that all of those neighborhoods um, get more than they, um, than they currently have.
Hi, my name is Angela. I'm an MSAS student here at Case. Um, did any of the data show or allude to housing programs like um, housing choice vouchers or public housing um, having a negative effect, like almost creating bias and the stigma around public housing? Um, I worked as a housing specialist, um, and it was hard to find landlords that would accept the housing mm -hmm. choice voucher. And did you guys see any data around that where it's not being as effective as it was supposed to be when it was put in place, like those programs? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think um, my knowledge is primarily on public housing redevelopment and mixed income communities. And one of our findings from on this study that um, of the mixed income study is that the the physical nature of the community is really radically changed. So there was a decrease in um, crime. There was an increase in the quality of housing. Um, and from the street, you could drive by and say, wow, that's a beautiful new building. And the landscape and the lighting and, and the security features and the, the, the new community um, playground right there in the center. Um, all of those features are really important and they were really well done. That was a success. Um, but um, these communities um, over time have been kind of re-stigmatized as like, okay, well that that's something new. Who is that for? It, and, and I think at first there was this open question, it could be for anyone. And um, what's happened in fact is that the units that were affordable tax credit units, some of those have been leased to Section 8 holders. And um, some of the kind of who lives there has remained, at least in um, the south side and the west side of Chicago, has remained a more um, low income community and, and um, predominantly African Americans. And so they have been re-stigmatized um, as whole places, not just individual households feeling a sense of stigma and exclusion, but entire communities have been. Um, to the degree that um, the interviews that I conducted with aldermen um, showed that they really prefer to not have mixed income um, housing in their um, in their wards anymore because that was a sense of, um, it, you know, we're not really sure that this model can thrive in terms of drawing um, people with economic resources. And in part, that's because these are communities that have long been um, segregated. Now, in the newer communities that are gentrifying, the new mixed income communities that are located near the central city, there's three of them. And in those communities, there's a much more positive um, support for mixed income strategies, in part because they have been incredibly attractive to higher income people and, and white people. So it is a more diverse uh, population. Microphones. Hi, I'm Brittany Mosley. I work at Case in undergraduate studies. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'm also pursuing a master in urban studies at CSU. And my question was, you mentioned that Chicago and Cleveland are kind of at the bottom as far as segregation, and mm -hmm. Houston's a median. Mm -hmm. What's at the top? What city's doing mm -hmm. it well, and what are they doing to do it so well? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the, the regions, these are whole regions. So for Chicago, that was a seven county region. I think for Cleveland, it may be a three or four county region. Um, so the, the regions that are doing better are almost all um, regions that don't have the longstanding manufacturing um, kind of presence that you can see in the Rust Belt cities um, and kind of the mid, the Great Lakes region cities. Um, so in part, um, they were more um, kind of racially, um, they were less racially diverse cities and they were also cities that um, did not have a loss of middle income jobs. Um, over the last 30 years as we've seen such radical shifts in our economy um, since the 1970s and, and 80s, um, it, those are the cities that are becoming, that, that are harder to um, address poverty within, but also to address to, um, integration within, places like Buffalo and Cleveland and Pittsburgh. Um, so those are the cities that are remaining pretty high on the list. Surprisingly, not very many in the Southeast. Um, my oh, one last thing I should say is the whole, the actual list of cities. If you're interested and you're you're listening on um, on the live stream, you can go to the Urban Institute report and look at the 100 metro areas. And it in the appendix there, um, you can find your own community and look it up.
Um, my question to you, I'm trying to figure out how to form. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Aaliyah Johnson. I'm a um, first year student at the Mandel School. Um, so my question to you is, do you think that communities can live separate um, without having integration as long as they have access to those resources. And I think I misheard you, um, but it sounded like you equated resources to white people, and I don't know if that's mm -hmm. exactly what you said, mm -hmm. but um, from a historical perspective, mm -hmm. you know, African Americans have been able to live on their own mm -hmm. and do for their people, but yeah. You know, there's the Black Wall Street, um, the war on drugs, you know, and racial terror that have taken places in their communities mm -hmm. in uh, mass incarceration have disrupted family lives. So that's a great question. So in my opinion, are the findings from the cost of segregation research would provide evidence for um, for more integration? That, that actually we can't ignore what we found, which is that a region is going to have a stronger economic vitality and prosperity um, with, um, you know, the regions that are more economically and, and prosperous are also regions where there's less segregation. So in that case, I would say we've got to think, we've got to be really clear that integration, residential integration is a piece of the puzzle. Now, saying that, I also believe that we've got to figure out how to value and place um, more capital um, and more political um, organizing within communities of color. And that ultimately, we, I wish that we could not, um, you know, kind of, I, I wish that there was a way that you know, I could say, oh, I'm going to prioritize one over the other. I'm not going to do that. I think integration and equity need to be dealt with hand in hand, just like I think segregation is not just about communities of color, but it's also about um, white, affluent, exclusive places. And we've got to learn how to address those realities of the choices that people continue to make to place themselves and their children in, um, in only white spaces. And so therefore, we've got to have that in our thinking, that inequality lens within our thinking when it comes to integration, that it's also about those folks learning how to, to operate differently. Emily, Dr. Crampton said his hand too, so whenever you can get over there. But you can go ahead and you can grab Neil while you're, oh, sorry, Neil. <laughs> Hi, I'm David Crampton, I'm on the MSAS faculty. I presume you're familiar with the Jim Crow thesis. Yes. And so, you know, what if the system of slavery is simply recreating itself and incorporating exclusion is just another form of that system of oppression? I guess my question is, can we really make an argument about dismantling a system of oppression with an economic argument? It's a great question. I think that there are um, people in positions of um, political power um, are largely moved by economic arguments. And so in many ways, I wish we didn't have to have this study. In many ways, it shouldn't be an economic question. It should be about morals and values, um, about human rights and human um, need. And yet, we can't ignore reality. And that is that um, the people have elected um, people in position and the, you know, posi people in positions of power um, traditionally are forced um, to address deficits and um, budget crisis and all of that. And so they are making decisions based on economic uh, realities. And if we don't, therefore, make some economic uh, arguments with this line of research, and if we don't continue to ask some cost-benefit analysis questions, then we won't have the data we need to move um, a population of political leaders towards, um, towards this, these kinds of policies. And yet, at the same time, I'm all in support of social movement organizing, of um, communities um, coming together as leaders, to continue um, a rights approach, where regardless of the economic realities, the right to 
a neighborhood, a right to a city, is, is something we, we have to continue as well. We can do one more question, and then Amy's going to be around. So for those who still have questions, you can come up and talk to her. But we've got students who need to get to class at 2 o'clock, so we want to honor that. So Neil. Hi, Amy. Hi. Um, my name is Neil Hodges. I'm with Neighborhood Connections. Great. Uh, I'm sure you know who that is. Yes. We work with Trusted Space. I manage a health initiative with my colleague, Jackie Matlou, the silver hair lady there. Uh, I'm a black male from, this, from the community. She's a white mm -hmm. a woman from the institution. We try to model the behavior we want uh, our um, partners to see. Always use the term, it has taken years to create the monster, it's, it's gonna take years to slay it. You reference if it would take Chicago 65 years to just catch up. Uh, do we have time to wait? And where do we start the conversation? I live in the same uh, um, neighborhood as Mark, the Larchmere, uh, um, a neighborhood, and I do know some of the resistance from the Larchmere Association, who does not want, who do not want another barbershop or salon on the strip, and they have their opinion. So, where and when does does the uh, conversation start? I know you're doing your part, but how do we expedite the process? Because we are so far behind. In the health initiative, we keep structural racism, systemic racism, at the forefront of the conversation. And it ain't easy. Mm -hmm. So how do we have that conversation sooner than later and continue it? Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I, I want to nominate you to have a follow-up conversation with anyone in the room who wants to engage with you. That's a, t that's a table talk that's going to happen outside in the, in the hallway at the sofas down the hall. And I'm serious. Anyone who wants to join you, that's what it's going to take. It's going to take people like you and your colleague um, standing up and saying, I'm a part of the solution, and I, I'm inviting you to join me in that, in that journey. Um, so I, I applaud your work in, in Cleveland, and I hope that today's um, presentation gave all of you um, something. It may not be the three takeaways that I offered, um, but it may be something else. And I hope that you'll follow up with your friends and, and your family and colleagues to share what you what you are walking away with, and what invitation you are going to answer um, to, for your own work, and please stay in touch if, if you have any interest in getting copies of the reports. I'm happy to share those, and I'm always happy to have a conversation. So thank you. All right, join me again.